Well, thanks, Marcia, and thank all of you for ministering to me in song earlier. Let's open our Bibles together at this time to the book of Galatians and the fourth chapter. Galatians chapter 4 and verse 21 to begin our study in God's Word this morning. Galatians 4.21 will be located on page 1246 if you're using the church Bible this morning. We want everyone to be considering and examining the passage of scripture that we're studying, whether you're new to finding your way around in the Bible or not. Today's date is May 7th, 2023. Today's text will begin in Galatians 4.21 and go right on down to the end of the chapter in verse 31. And the title of this morning's message is A Tale of Two Mothers. A Tale of Two Mothers. And I'd like to begin with a short list of things that our mothers taught us. First, they taught us about religion when they said things like you better pray that stain comes out of the carpet. <laughs> they also taught us about satire when they said things like if you fall out of that tree and break both your legs don't come running to me. <laughs> Mothers also taught us about time travel when they said things like, if you don't quit misbehaving, I'm going to knock you into the middle of next week. <laughs> and finally, the most important thing that our mothers taught us was about the circle of life when they said things like, I brought you into the world and I can take you out. That's the real circle of life. <laughs> well, our message this morning is about two mothers. One of whom who represents the bondage of the law of Moses and another mom who represents the liberty of God's grace. And the story begins in Galatians 4 and verse 21, where the Apostle Paul wrote these words. Tell me, ye that desire to be under the law, do you not hear the law? <laughs> now, as you may know, the Galatians were saved by grace like we are today. But some of them wanted to be like the Jews under the law in the Old Testament. So Paul says, if you guys want to be under the law, you must not have heard the law. And to convince them of that, Paul decided to remind them of a simple story that's found in the Law of Moses. A story that illustrates why they shouldn't want to be under the law. That story begins <clears throat> in verse 22, where Paul says, For it is written, written in the law, that Abraham had two sons, the one by a bondmaid, the other by a free woman. Now the free woman was Abraham's wife, whose name was Sarah. And Sarah couldn't have children. She couldn't be a mom. 
At least that's what it says in our first reference in Genesis 11.30 where Moses wrote, Sarah was barren. She had no child. But one chapter later, God made Abraham a promise when he told him in Genesis 12 and verse 2, I will make of thee a great nation. And when Abraham heard that, he knew God was promising to miraculously open Sarah's womb and give him a son. All he had to do was sit back and wait for God to keep his promise. <laughs> but if you know the story, you know that when years went by, many years went by, and Sarah still had no children, she decided to help God keep his promise. She told Abraham, her husband, to sleep with her bondmaid because a baby born to her slave would belong to her. Because in those days, everything that slaves owned belonged to their masters, including their babies. So Abraham slept with his wife's maid, whose name was Hagar. Hagar. And she bore him a son named Ishmael. <laughs> but then God kept his promise and miraculously opened Sarah's womb. And she bore him a son named Isaac. But there was a big difference between those two boys. A difference that Paul goes on to tell us about in verse 23 of our text where Paul says, But he who was of the bondwoman was born after the flesh, but he of the free woman was by promise. Well, Sarah's son Isaac is the one who was born of promise because as said, God had promised to miraculously give Abraham a son. But Hagar's son Ishmael is said to be born after the flesh. So what does that mean? <laughs> well, that's a reference to something in John 1.13 where the Apostle John talks about someone who was born of the will of the flesh. You see folks, it was God's will for Abraham to wait for God to miraculously open Sarah's womb to give her a son. But it was the will of Abraham's flesh to try to help God keep his promise by sinfully sleeping with his wife's maid. God doesn't need any help keeping his promises, folks, so don't offer him any. Now, as we read on, Paul tells us why he's telling the Galatians this story in verse 24 in your Bible, where he says, Which things are an allegory? For these are the two covenants, the one from the Mount Sinai, which gendereth to bondage, which is Hagar. That's how you spell Hagar in the New Testament. Now that word allegory there, in that context, means an illustration. Paul, for the last few chapters, has been telling the Galatians why they shouldn't want to be under the law. And now he's telling them a story that illustrates it. He begins by explaining that these two moms represent two covenants. And we know that the covenant from Mount Sinai there represents the covenant of 
the law. Because that's where God gave Moses the law, according to your next reference in Deuteronomy 33, 2. The Lord came from Sinai, and from his right hand went a law for them. And it was called the covenant of the law, because a covenant is an old word for a contract. The law of Moses was a legal and binding contract in which the party of the first part, God, <laughs> promised the party of the second part, the Jews, that if they obeyed him, he'd provide them with good health and wealth and with eternal life. But if they didn't obey him, he'd curse them with bad health, no wealth, and eternal damnation. And verse 24 says that the law gendereth to bondage. Now that word gendereth means to father a kid, <laughs> as you see in your next reference in Job 21. Verse 10, their bull gendereth and faileth not. Their cow calveth and casteth not her calf. The bull impregnates the cow and doesn't fail to do so. And the cow then has the calf and doesn't fail to do so. But, see that word gendereth there? The bull is said to gender the calf. And that's because, well, I don't know if you know this or not, but the gender of an offspring is determined by the father at conception. That means when King Henry VIII had his wife, the queen, executed for not giving birth to a male heir for him, he should have turned the sword on himself and started singing I was Henry VIII I was Henry remember that? nod your head if you remember that song <laughs> but the point is when verse 24 says that the law gendereth to bondage it's saying the law fathers slaves it makes men slaves to what Romans 8.15 calls the spirit of bondage, which is fear. The law made the Jews slaves to the fear of what would happen to them if they didn't obey their master God. You see, back in those days, masters could punish their slaves for disobedience even to the point of taking their lives. So slaves lived in fear that their masters would take their lives for not obeying them. And under the law of Moses, folks, the Jews were afraid that their master God would take their eternal lives for not obeying him. But then the Lord Jesus Christ died to do what it says in your next reference there in Hebrews 2.15, he died to deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage, to slavery. And folks, this passage is all about how Hagar is symbolic of that slavery. She's symbolic of that slavish fear of death as Paul makes even more clear in verse 25 in your Bible. For this Hagar is, or represents, like when we say this is my body and this is my blood, the Lord was saying it represents. This Hagar represents Mount Sinai in Arabia and answereth to Jerusalem, which now is, and is in bondage, with her children. Now, do you see that phrase answereth to there in verse 25? 
There's only one other place in the Bible where that exact phrase is used, and it's in your next reference, in Proverbs 27, 19, where it says that in water, face answereth to face. Now it's talking about how when you look at your reflection in a pool of water, you see exactly what you look like. They say mirrors don't lie, and that's true, and lucky for me, they don't laugh either. Or mine would be in stitches. Good thing they don't talk, or they'd, mine would say, how'd you get so old so fast? <laughs> Isn't that what yours says in the morning? Maybe not. But your image in a mirror of water answers to what you look like. And verse 25 is saying that Jerusalem looks like what Hagar looked like. In other words, you could see the story of Jerusalem in the story of Hagar. She was in bondage to Abraham and Sarah. And as their slave, they gave her plenty of thou shalt and thou shalt not. Because that's how you treated slaves. And all of the children that Hagar eventually had through Ishmael were born slaves. Because the son of a slave is a slave. And in that story, you can see the story of the people of Jerusalem, the people of Israel. The people of Israel were slaves under the bondage of the law. And God gave them plenty of thou shalt and thou shalt not. Because again, that's how you treat slaves. And all the children that were born to the Jews were also in bondage because the son of a slave is a slave. And the thing about slaves, folks, is no matter how hard they worked to obey their masters, they could never be free. They could never earn their freedom. And that's a picture of how no matter how hard the Jews worked at obeying God, they could never earn the freedom, the liberty of salvation. Now, by being an obedient slave back in those days, you could earn temporary benefits like more food, better lodging, and you could avoid getting beaten <laughs> or punished in, in other ways. And that was true of the Jews as well. The more obedient they were to God's laws, the less he would punish them with bad health and bad wealth. And the more benefits he would give them, like good wealth and prosperity. But they could never earn eternal life like slaves can earn freedom. Now, as I've mentioned before, that doesn't mean that nobody got saved under the law for 1,500 years. <laughs> Jews who knew they couldn't keep the law, they understood that the sacrifices they were bringing paid for their sins. Just as we understand that the sacrifice of Christ paid for our sins. But when verse 25 says that Hagar represents the Jerusalem that now is, well, that tells us that Sarah must represent another Jerusalem. And she does. She represents the covenant of grace. And things are very different for the children of that Jerusalem as you see in your very next verse, in verse 26. But Jerusalem, which is above, that Sarah represents, is free! And she is the mother of us all. Now, as you may know, there's a, there's a Jerusalem above us in heaven. You read about it in Hebrews 12, 22, where it talks about the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem. The heavenly Jerusalem is called the city of God, God's city, because that's where he lives. 
And someday, that Jerusalem's going to come down to the earth. In your next reference, the Apostle John, John saw a vision of that in Revelation 21.2. John talks about in the book of Revelation what he saw in his vision. And he says, I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven. That's the Jerusalem that will be on the earth as opposed to the one that verse 25 says now is on the earth. And New Jerusalem must have children too. Because Paul says in verse 26 she's the mother of us all. So what does that mean? <laughs> well I think it means the same thing that Paul talks about in Romans 4 2 to 11 when he talks about Abraham and how he's the father of all them that believe. Abraham was the father of all men who have ever believed and gotten saved in any dispensation. So Sarah's New Jerusalem must be the mother of all them that believe and got saved in any dispensation. Hey folks, if you're saved this morning, you're a child of heaven. We know hell has children because, well, what did the Lord say about the religious leaders in Matthew 23, 15? Woe unto you scribes and Pharisees, you bunch of hypocrites, for you compass sea and land to make one proselyte. And when he is made, you make him twofold more the child of hell than yourselves. So if you're saved this morning, you're a child of heaven. A child of New Jerusalem in heaven. Because Sarah's the mother of all who ever believe. Now, let me remind you of why Abraham is called the father of all them that believe. We haven't covered this in quite a while. It is because Abraham believed that God would give him a son when it was impossible for him and Sarah to give themselves a son. In other words, he believed God could do what it was impossible for them to do. And that is what every believer who ever lived had to believe to get saved, folks. Every believer who ever lived got saved by believing that God could do what they couldn't do for themselves. Because the Bible says you can't save yourself. Because to save yourself, you'd have to do what it says in James 2. You'd have to keep the law of Moses perfectly. James said, whosoever shall keep the whole law and yet offend in one point, he's guilty of all of it. For he that said don't commit adultery also said don't kill. How if you commit no adultery, yet if thou kill, thou art become a transgressor of the law. And it is simply impossible for men to keep even the Ten Commandments it's talking about there, let alone the other 603 commandments in the law. So men have always had to believe that God can save them when they can't save themselves. And that is how Abraham became the father of us all, and that's how Sarah's new Jerusalem is the mother of us all. Listen, Sarah was barren to begin with, right? But to make it doubly impossible for her and Abraham to have a son, God waited till she was 90 years old to give her a son. Way past the age when a woman can bear a son, even if she isn't barren to begin with. And God waited till Abraham was a hundred years old. Then too old to father a child. Then God empowered him 
to father a child. I looked it up. Go check online the, in the Guinness Book of World Records. The oldest man who ever impregnated a woman, 92. God waited till it was physically doubly impossible for them to have a kid to give them a kid. And it is just as doubly impossible for you to save yourself from your sins. No matter how good you are, you need a savior. And when verse 26 says, the mother of us all is free. It means as her children, you and I are born free. Because the son of a free woman is free, like we've been seeing in this allegory. We are as free as Sarah's son Isaac was. And the thing that we're free from is the bondage, the slavery of the law. At least I think that's what Paul is saying in Romans 8, 15 and 16. Our apostle tells us, you have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you have received the Holy Spirit. The Spirit itself bears witness with our spirit that we're the children of God. We've been made free from the fear that men have under the law that they're not the children of God because they're not keeping the law good enough. If you want to know if you're a child of God, don't ask yourself how well you're keeping the law. All you got to do is open this book. This book that the Holy Spirit wrote. And in this book, the Spirit testifies with your spirit that you're a child of God by faith in Christ. And not by keeping the law. But as we read on, Paul says something that doesn't seem to be true of Sarah and Hagar in verse 27. Where it says, For it is written, Rejoice thou barren that bearest not. Break forth and cry thou that travailest not. For the desolate hath many more children than she which hath a husband. Now, the barren one that bearest not in that verse was Sarah. We've already seen that, right? She never travailed, or we use the word labored, in childbirth. But that means she which hath a husband is Hagar. And you go back and read that story and you'll see Ab uh, Abraham was not Hagar's husband. He was Sarah's husband. Now that tells me that Paul's not talking about Sarah and Hagar anymore. He's talking about what they represent. Hagar represented earthly Jerusalem under the law, like we said. And at that time, God gave the Jews that law at a time when they had a husband. Jerusalem had a husband when God gave them the law. Look at Jeremiah 2.2. God told the prophet Jeremiah, Go and cry in the ears of Jerusalem saying, Thus saith the Lord, I remember the love of thine espousals when you went after me in the wilderness. Now if you know your Bible, you know that that word espousal is our, the word that we would use for engagement. The Jews got engaged to God in the wilderness and they married God in the wilderness. We covered that pretty extensively a couple years ago. But the reason that the allegory implies that Sarah didn't have a husband is because she represented New Jerusalem. And New Jerusalem is not going to have a husband for at least the next thousand years according to your next reference. Revelation 20 verses 7, uh, verse 7 <clears throat> And 21, 9 and 10 says, When the thousand years are expired, one of the seven angels talked with me, saying, 
I will show thee the bride, the Lamb's wife. And he showed me that great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God. Those verses say, after the millennial kingdom of heaven on earth is over, and at the beginning of God's eternal kingdom, he's going to marry New Jerusalem. But now, we have to ask how Paul could say that Sarah had more children than Hagar. I mean, folks, Sarah is the mother of all the Jews, right? And Hagar is the mother of who? Anybody? All the Arabs. And there has always been way more Arabs in the world than there have been Jews. I looked it up. According to the internet anyway, there's 14 million Jews in the world today and 200 million Arabs. It has never been true that Sarah had more children than Hagar. And here it doesn't help to remember that Paul's talking about what they re represent. Because it's never been true that New Jerusalem has more children than Jerusalem, which now is. It has never been true that there's more believers than unbelievers in the world. There's always been more children of hell than children of heaven. So, what's Paul talking about here? What's the solution here? Is he wrong? Well, did you notice there in verse 30? I'm sorry, not verse 30. Not verse, oh, verse 27. That verse 27 begins with the words, as it is written. Do you know where it's written? The place where that's written is in the book of Isaiah, and Isaiah was a prophet. And as a prophet, he was predicting that someday there'd be more saved children of Sarah than unsaved children of Hagar in the New Jerusalem. That's the context of the verse Paul's quoting. I gave it to you in your next reference in Isaiah 54, 1 and 5. More are the children of the desolate than the children of the married wife. For, this is why, for thy maker is thine husband. The Lord of hosts is his name. Well, we just saw that saved Jews in New Jerusalem don't have a husband. They won't be married to God until the thousand years are expired. That's when there'll be more children of heaven than there are children of hell. Now you guys say, well, wait a minute, how's that going to happen? How's that going to happen if unbelievers have always outnumbered believers? Well, we know that Jews are going to keep having children in New Jerusalem because it says in Isaiah 9-7, of the increase of his government, there will be no end. Hey, don't we know and believe that the Jews are going to be the governors of the earth? in God's government of the world. And the only way the increase of that government will never end is if they keep having kids. And I personally think the same will be true for God's government in heaven too, where we're going to be ruling. But all I know for sure is that's when people in New Jerusalem are going to do what it says in verse 27 there, that's when they're going to really begin to rejoice. Because they won't be outnumbered anymore. Do you know what happens when God's people are outnumbered? They get persecuted. <laughs> Look at the next two verses in your Bible, in verses 28 and 29. Paul says, Now we, brethren, as Isaac was, are the children of promise. But, as then he that was born after the flesh persecuted him that was born after the Spirit, even so it is now. Ishmael persecuted his little brother 
And all the Arab children of Hagar have always persecuted the Jewish children of Sarah. Because if you think about it, the Jews being outnumbered are smaller, the little brother of the Arabs, even today. But saved Jews in New Jerusalem will do what verse 27 says and rejoice when they're no longer the minority. And so will we. I mean, we don't suffer a whole lot of persecution, but aren't you looking forward to living in New Jerusalem where we're not going to be surrounded by the wickedness of the unsaved majority? I know I'm looking forward to it. But, verse 28 now says that you can only look forward to that if you're a child of promise like Isaac was. And you know what Paul says in Titus 1-2? He talks about eternal life, which God that cannot lie did what? Promised before the world began. Before the world began, God promised to give a miraculous birth to anybody in this dispensation who would just believe that Christ died for their sins. And when we believe that, we were miraculously born of that promise, like Isaac was. And as odd as it sounds, Paul claimed that he gave birth to us as a man. <laughs> Look at how this passage started. The first verse that Joe read for us in the scripture reading earlier in verse 19. Paul says, My little children, of whom I travail in birth again until Christ be formed in you. <laughs> so what does that mean? I mean, we know Paul begat the Galatians in the same way he begat the Corinthians because, well, look what he says in 1 Corinthians 4.15. He told the Corinthians, though you have 10,000 instructors in Christ, yet have ye not many fathers. You only got one father, he says, for in Christ Jesus I have begotten you through the gospel. Paul gave them the gospel and when they believed it, they were reborn by means of, of a miraculous spiritual birth. But if Paul begat us as a father, if he gendered us, how come he's speaking about laboring in birth as a mother? I know all you moms wish our husbands could feel that, but well, you know what? A few months ago, my wife and I were watching an episode of Call the Midwife. Anybody see the series on Netflix? It's on PBS too. Like 10 or 12 episodes of seasons of this. And in one of the episodes, one of the husbands of the midwife's lady they were caring for had what they call Cuvade syndrome. Anybody ever hear? Now you nurses, you don't count. You can't, don't spoil the Cuvade syndrome is where a father experiences what they call sympathy labor pains. According to what that says, if a husband is really into his wife's pregnancy, he can have morning sickness and be barfing right alongside his wife there, doing what we used to call the, the technicolor yawn. You know, and that's what we used to call it. And that is what Paul felt when he begat the Galatians. He was so into giving them the gospel, he felt the labor pains. That's what he says. But now that they'd fallen for the law, he says back there in verse 19, he was having to travail labor and birth again by going over the gospel again and reminding them that they were saved by grace not by the law. And trying to get him to do what Sarah told Abraham to do in the last two verses of our text. Back in your Bible now, in verses 30 and 31. Nevertheless, what saith the Scripture? 
cast out the bondwoman and her son. For the son of the bondwoman shall not be heir with the son of the free woman, Sarah told Abraham. So then, brethren, we are not children of the bondwoman, but of the free. As the free sons of Sarah, Paul wanted the Galatians to say what Sarah told her husband there. That the son of her slave, Hagar, was not going to be here with her free sons. Paul wanted the Galatians to admit the same thing. That there's no profit in the law. And he wanted them to cast out the bondwoman, who represents the law, and her sons who represent all the legalists who are trying to put them under the law. And he wants us all to rest in the liberty of new covenant grace, folks. So anytime anybody tries to tell you that you should obey the law of Sabbath day or the law's diet laws or anytime anybody tries to get you to fear that God is punishing you because you haven't been obeying them. You know what you should do? You should just ask them, tell me, ye that desire to be under the law, don't you hear the law? Don't you understand what it's saying? That question always reminds me of a time travel movie that I saw years ago where a man was fixing to go back to his own time 200 years ago Somebody asked him what he was going to miss most about the future. And he said, television was nice. <laughs> and the guy who asked him the question said, if you think TV was nice, you didn't see enough of it. <laughs> and anybody who tries to convince you that the law is nice, they haven't heard enough of it, folks. But you have. So don't fall for it, no matter what those nice TV preachers say during their programs, right? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we, we thank you for the simplicity of your word. We know that the Galatians, probably some of them, were good students of your word. And yet Paul understood the importance of sometimes just breaking it down and making it simple. We pray, Father, that uh, we might be always able to do that as we come here to learn your word and get the sense of what you're trying to get across to us. And we pray that we might be the better servants of thine for it. We pray it in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Bless